rise and join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you to the students of PS59 for that wonderful performance and for leading our Pledge of Allegiance. Here to deliver the invocation, please welcome Rabbi Potasnik. Delivering the invocation, please welcome to the stage Rabbi Potasnik. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, you know the story of a nun that was locked out of her car, and she looked up to the heavens and she said, God, please help me. Suddenly a young man on a motorcycle, scruffy looking, pulled up and said, Sister, let me help you. She looks up to heaven and says, God, thank you for sending me this nice young man. The motorcyclist looks at her and says, Sister, I'm not such a nice young man. I just was released from prison. She says, what were you in prison for? He said, carjacking. <laughs> she looked up to heaven and says, God, thank you for sending me a professional. <laughs> I just want to say that I'm here because Ben Kalos and I enjoy a two-fold relationship, both professional and personal. For many years, I lived in Brooklyn Heights. I moved to Manhattan purposely to be near Ben Kalos. If that, doesn't, if that doesn't speak of commitment, Ben, I don't know what does. You know, there is a town in the Midwest where the town hall has no electricity. In order to illuminate that room, every member of the community has to bring a lantern. And maybe there's a lesson to all of us. If we're going to eliminate some of this darkness, if we're going to confront these challenges that it requires, every person to carry that Latin and to stand tall. Years ago, I recall uh, being invited to the installation of an archbishop. His name is Edwin O'Brien. The ceremony was held at St. Patrick's Cathedral. And he sent me two tickets. I arrived that day, and I had this extra ticket. There was an elderly Catholic woman who wanted to enter, but she didn't have a ticket. So I went over to her, and I said, here, here's an extra one. Please go inside. She looked at me and said, who are you? I said, I'm a rabbi. She said, a rabbi? Only in New York City for a Catholic to get into St. Patrick's Cathedral do you need a rabbi to give you a ticket. <laughs> and maybe the message is for all of us there that we have to open doors for one another. Tonight, tomorrow, we're going to observe the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. I think... Uh, when we look back, the greatest sin of that period was that too many were silent when they should have shouted. So when we see the hatred that is going on today, 
And you know, the one who hates me today will hate you tomorrow, that we cannot afford to be silent. So Ben, I'm thankful to you, you and your colleagues, Gail Brew, who's here as well, and so many other people of conscience who are always there to raise their voices and to say never again will we be silent. There was a magazine uh, some time ago entitled Life. After Life, there was a magazine called People. After People, there was a magazine called Us. After Us, there was a magazine called Self. <laughs> but we Jews read from right to left. So first, it can start with self, but above all, it's about all of us as one people who must make this life meaningful for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rabbi Potasnik. Now, reading First They Came by Pastor Martin Nymoller, please welcome Sandrea Coleman. Greetings all, I'm grateful to be here. First they came for the communists and I did not speak out. Because I was not a communist, then they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out for me. Thank you. Thank you so very much for all the participants in our program thus far, from the students at PS59 to Rabbi Potasnik to Sandrea Coleman for that beautiful uh, reading. Uh, we will be getting uh, to the main port of the portion where we'll be hearing a lot about our next speaker, uh, our Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. Though she uh, represents the total borough of Manhattan, it seems like we get a lot of her love and attention here in the neighborhood and that she does great work for us here and throughout the borough. Uh, please join me in welcoming our Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. And I have to say, uh, I want to thank the reverend. I want to thank the rabbi. The rabbi always has jokes that are hysterically funny, as you could see. And I have one that's not relevant necessarily, but I think it's funny. The, my friend was recently offered a job She's a uh, assistant curator in New York City at a museum. And she was offered a job in the Midwest uh, as director of a museum. So she checked with a friend of her brother's who had gone to the university there to ask about this particular museum and whether it made sense to go and could she do the fundraising and so on and so forth. And uh, she actually went out to the location in the Midwest. And when she got there, she sat down with her brother's friend, who happens to be a doctor at the hospital. And he looked at her and he said, you know, this museum is a wonderful museum, has great exhibits, but there's one problem. It's in a city where everybody who lives there is in the witness protection program. So I don't know how you're gonna raise any money. So she declined the job. <laughs> that was last week. <laughs> so she's still here. But anyway, I want to thank certainly uh, Council Member Ben Kalos. We do work very closely together. He's a very special and wonderful elected, the kind of person who cares about uh, both substance and local constituent issues. And to me, that's what elected officials are supposed to be all about. So he has, yes, thank you very much. And I mean that. So there's a couple of things that we've been working on together. Um, I certainly want to thank him because he's chair of the Contracts Committee, which is a really important committee. And just last week, uh, one of the issues that he has tackled with us is the issue of how do you get the city of New York to purchase locally food products? It is so frustrating that we want to save the farmers upstate. And yet, correction, 
uh, children's services, uh, even the hospitals purchased from China and from California, not necessarily from New York State. And those of us who care about upstate as well as the city know that it would be fresher, uh, we could get the same price, and we need to have local purchasing. So you can imagine the billions of dollars that get spent on food, the complications of the transportation by the farmers. But anyway, I had passed a bill a while ago when I was in the council stating this should be a focus, and to the credit of the council member, he is making it just that. So that's just one example. Then there's just his love and knowledge. I pretend, but he knows data. He knows technology. I pretend to know data and technology. I did pass the open data bill in the city council, um, but that's only one example. Ben Kalos knows we are working together because open data is what drives this city and this country if it's done correctly. And so we're always trying to get the agencies to have real time. They are mandated to do that. They're mandated to take their data and put it on the open data portal. And we're working with the community boards and others, even the courts on the state level, to get this data to help people in the neighborhood so that they know what is going on locally. That's the short version. He knows all about it, I pretend. Um, we're also, one of the big issues that you are very concerned about is congestion pricing. It is not anybody's favorite topic, but the question is how do you get the subways to be their best with funding? I am very upset about Andy Byford leaving. Um, I, um, I called it a gut punch that the governor gave him and all of us. There are very few elected or very few appointed or very few civic and government leaders who can come into a big city like this and be beloved. He was as transparent as he appeared in the press. He was a good friend, he is a good friend. But I can tell you he was, um, I think the last time I was with him was at an elevator installation in Washington Heights. It had gone well. He thanked his staff of about 50. When I say staff, I mean real workers. And then he said to me quietly, they're all going to another division. I said, how the hell are you gonna do your job when the people who love you and admire you are going to another division? So I knew even two months ago, this was not going well. Um, his staff loved him because he treated them with respect. So we'll have to see what goes on. But this issue of congestion pricing, I assume it arrives. It was passed by the state. I did support it in the council. The issue is what and when is the governor going to appoint to the task force to evaluate, set the rates, et cetera. So the one thing we've done is say, for goodness sakes, two people from Manhattan must be on that task force. People who live in the area of 60th Street and somebody from northern Manhattan. That's just, and then there's the issue of residential parking. I will not necessarily be pro or con, but for goodness sakes, we did look at what is going on internationally in cities and around the United States. Is it working or is it not working? At least have the discussion. So that's the issue, another controversial issue. I do want to thank everyone here from Roosevelt Island. I see Christina Del Falco here. You're working on the library. Thank you very much to the council member. Zero waste. And I love the fact that the seniors on Roosevelt Island love our fresh Food for Seniors program more than anybody else in Borough of Manhattan. So thank you very much. And thank you, Roosevelt Island, for everything that you do. In terms of the schools, I do not understand why there's not a social worker in every single school in the city of New York. Every single school. So the city council and the mayor did come up with some money, but it's not enough. I can tell you the school where young people uh, attend who are fortunately involved with the murder of the young woman in Morningside Park. And I was just met with the principal. They have one social worker for almost 600 young people, pre-K to eighth grade, three days a week. That's it. And that's all they have. She's almost in tears. What she wants is a social worker, culturally appropriate, to work with young people, who, all of whom have a lot of issues. We all do. But this is how I think the teachers could be more effective, with support. Um, census, we don't need to talk about the census because there's an amazing <coughs> table outside. Uh, we do have a complete count committee. We are focusing on um, everything from the clergy and the imams and the rabbis and putting together a wonderful booklet on how you can talk about the census if you're in the faith-based community. 
<coughs> we're also going to be training uh, people who deliver home delivered meals because that is the person you trust most. And there are so many other ways that we're all going to be involved. But needless to say, um, we have to make sure that we are all counted. In terms of the capital funding, we have until February 28th in our office. The city council has more time, but we are very clear for the parks, the cultural, the schools, anything that's bricks and mortar technology. We work with your council member to come up with as much dollars as we can for the community. And the same thing with the Manhattan Community Board application is due February 14th. Um, so is the Solid Waste Advisory Board. We're the one borough that has a very active, because it is charter mandated, how our planet, particularly in Manhattan, I know there are other boroughs, but particularly in Manhattan, can be sustainable into the future. And I know that there are people here who are on that particular board. Uh, and just finally, I want to say, I want to thank all of you. I know that Lenox Hill Hospital is not specifically in this council district, but when many of us use it, I've certainly used it many times. And we look forward, we have a task force, we've been working with Northwell, and we hope that there'll be some positive community-based applications, not something that is just wanted by Northwell. So thank you to the uh, council member. I wanna make sure that you know that Isabel Abreu is right here. She is our liaison to this board and she does a great job. Thank you, have a great day. Thank you, council member Ben Kalos. Let's hear it one more time for our borough president, Gail Brewer. I also want to thank again Rabbi Joseph Potasnik of the New York Board of Rabbis on his humorous invocation, uh, to Sandrea Coleman, co-leader of the Isaacs Holmes Coalition for her reading, the talented students at PS59 led by music director uh, Jeannie Kim for their performance of the peace song, I'll Make a Difference in the Pledge of Allegiance. I do want to thank Memorial Sloan Kettering for hosting us now for a sixth year in a row. Phoebe Kamek, uh, Shakima Grant, and Ed Swisher. Thank you, and thank you to all the folks, and especially folks in the IT booth. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Councilmember Ben Kalos. I have the honor of representing 168,000 New Yorkers on the Upper East Side, Midtown, East El Barrio, and Roosevelt Island, the City Council for the past six years, 25 days, 13 hours, 44 minutes, and 18 seconds. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. If not, welcome back. And I know you're just here for bagels with Ben, and that's just fine with me. You don't have to wait until our State of the District to see me. All year, you can join me and neighbors for a discussion on the first Friday of each month, work with staff at Policy Night, talk to an attorney for free, and support local agriculture at our fresh food box. I'll even make house calls for Ben in your building at your co-op condo or tenants association meeting. We are here to help. We are here for everyone, from seniors to families with services like housing, finances, and nutrition, even assistance finding a job. We're also here to support the community, and we've accomplished so much in such a short amount of time. Today we'll be highlighting what we've been able to do together as we focus on what we can accomplish and the remaining one year, 11 months, five days, 10 hours, 15 minutes, and 36 seconds. <laughs> winning new school seats and investing in education, getting big money out of politics and winning ethics reforms for good government, fighting over development and winning rezonings for affordable housing, helping the homeless, building new parks, protecting public health and safety, improving commutes, and cleaning up the neighborhood. When I first began fighting to provide more pre-kindergarten seats in our district, I was a newlywed, and now my daughter is two. In 2014, we only had 154 seats for over 1,000 four-year-olds. In September, we finally closed the gap when we cut the ribbon on our third pre-K center, this one on 76th Street, with 180 seats. After securing 900 new seats for a total of 1,122 as of this school year, we finally have universal pre-kindergarten on the Upper East Side. When I ran in 2013, our research showed that federal funding available for pre-kindergarten would not only cover four-year-olds, but also three-year-olds. 
Just as we fought for the mayor to keep his promise on universal pre-kindergarten, we must fight for universal 3K on the Upper East Side, hopefully in time for my daughter, or otherwise I'm out $30,000. You can join the fight to make this happen by signing the petition at bencalis.com slash 3K. Beyond pre-kindergarten, I've never believed the Upper East Side had enough school seats. Despite all the new residential construction, when I was elected, the city had no plans to build any additional school seats. As the New York Times reported, I authored and passed the law requiring the Department of Education to show how they calculated seats need and prove it. Last year, we got funding for 640 school seats, and this year, thanks to my law, the Department of Education adding funding for another 184 school seats for a total of 824. I ran for office because I wanted to do a lot of things differently than other elected officials. We were one of the first council districts to offer participatory budgeting, letting any resident, 11 or older, vote online or in person how to spend a million dollars from my office in the community. Over the years, we've begun to see projects from participatory budgeting become reality. In October, we cut the ribbon on a new $600,000 hydroponic science lab at PS 183. Thank you to Delegate Michael Extract and to 1,514 residents who voted for the lab in 2017. In June, we cut the ribbon on $600,000 playground for PS 77198. Thank you to uh, 1,134 voters in 2017. We also celebrated the completion of the school's $8.2 million exterior renovation. It looks like a Hilton now. <laughs> My district is lucky to have one of the best high schools in New York City. Eleanor Roosevelt High School, which has a dance studio instead of a real gym. That hasn't stopped their women's volleyball team from becoming citywide champions. When I hosted a town hall with Mayor de Blasio in 2018, Amanda Calviero, who was then a senior at the school, asked the mayor for a gym. As you may have read in our time, we hosted a petition for the new gym, and it received over 5,000 signatures Soon after, I was proud to join School Construction Authority President Lorraine Grillo to announce a new gym for these champion athletes. We'll be breaking ground this spring above the pre-K center just down the block. <laughs> the beginning of every school year has been a nightmare for parents waiting hours for buses that never show up, or worse yet, lost somewhere in the city with their children. That's why I introduced legislation in response to residents' complaints at First Friday to put a GPS on every school bus. When dozens of children, many with special needs, were stuck on buses for hours due to a freak winter storm in December 2018, were able to pass this long sought after law. I wish that were the end of the story. The Department of Education did not get their homework done on time for the beginning of the school year, and we're now working with parents like Beth Pilchik to make sure it gets done. The city has turned to VIA, with whom we are working closely to get the GPS online, complete with an app for parents to keep track of their vehicle and their children by the start of next school year. <laughs> Once we know where the school buses actually are, it is vital that we keep our kids safe as they get on and off. We've all seen cars speed past school buses as children get off and on, putting them at risk. We've even seen one man drive up on a sidewalk. After Governor Cuomo signed the law allowing municipalities to implement school bus stop arm cameras, I have the legislation to just do that. We've already received a hearing and you can have help pass this legislation by signing the petition at bencalos.com slash stop arm. Now everyone knows that an education doesn't end in the classroom. My favorite part of school was after school. I was never great at sports and I always got pecked last in gym class. So the after school program where I actually got to play basketball outside of class and wasn't picked last was a highlight for me. But please don't feel too bad. Now that I'm a council member, I always win at basketball with best, especially when I play against interns and staff. <laughs> in New York, there are more than half a million children in K through 12 schools who are left alone and unsupervised during after school hours. We know from research that after school programming keeps young people positively engaged during the hours of 2 to 6 p.m. when they are most vulnerable to getting in trouble with the criminal justice system. With a recent spike in young adults robbing younger students in the area, we need universal after school more than ever. I want to thank our Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer for testifying in favor of this important legislation. We won, yes. 
We won breakfast after the bell and universal school lunch. If we can win universal after school, we can complement that with feeding every kid supper, which is already federally funded. According to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if we can address every child's physiological needs with universal breakfast, lunch, snack, and supper, their safety needs with Child Health Plus, and finally, if we can offer love, belonging, and esteem through universal after school, we can provide a positive future for an entire generation of children. Just weeks ago, the council heard universal after school legislation I authored that would mandate an after school slot for any of the 1.1 million public school students who need them. Learning continues after school and throughout our lives. That's why I love books and I love our New York public libraries. <laughs> Last month, we even cut the ribbon on a $2.5 million renovation funded by my office, Speaker Johnson and Mayor Bill de Blasio when we reopened the 67th Street Library where I got my first library card as a kid. We've already broken ground on a new library on Roosevelt Island and you are all invited to the ribbon cutting when it happens. As we reap the rewards of investing in our education, we must ensure the rest of our government is working for everyone, not just those with wealth and power. When I was elected, I thought I should work for you, not for other politicians or outside interests. So I refused outside income and tens of thousands of dollars in personal income from political leaders called Lulus. When I was elected, uh, then I wrote the laws that made Lulus illegal and even banned outside income to make the city council a full-time job. The New York Times called on Albany to follow the reforms I authored. It should come as no surprise that they took the money without the ethics reforms. Making outside income and Lulus illegal helped while politicians were still spending their time whining and dining millionaires and billionaire real estate developers to give them $5,000 contributions. In 2013, half the money mayoral candidates raised were in these big contributions that are the maximum allowed under law. Anyone here ever give anyone $5,000 without expecting anything in return? I once offered somebody a valuable gift, and I expected her to spend the rest of her life with me. She said yes, and our daughter is too. I work for you. So I wasn't chasing money from real estate developers, but everyone else was. And while politicians say one thing, not Gail Brewer, but others, uh, city land use policy continues to force out everyday New Yorkers to make room for the wealthy to park their money in super scrapers. That's why I advocated for full public matching campaign finance reform that would make $175 as valuable as a new lower contribution limit of $1,500 for borough-wide office by matching each small dollar with eight public dollars to become $1,575. When the stronger program I supported was put on the ballot in 2018, 1.1 million people, 80% of the voters, agreed. I then authored two new laws applying the new system to the public advocates race and to guarantee a full public match. The results are already in and we've flipped the campaign finance system on its head so that candidates are no longer being financed by majority big dollars, but instead by small dollars. Public advocate Jamani Williams is the first candidate to win citywide office without real estate money. In 2019, the New York Times joined me in calling on Albany to implement the system I authored to, quote, foster competition and challenge entrenched party machines. Once again, Albany failed. After our success at the ballot in 2018, the council convened a 2019 Charter Revision Commission uh, that I believe was also sponsored by our Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer, in which I participated. Although uh, the Charter Commission did not accept all 72 of the proposals I came up with after reading the whole charter, they did put five before the voters. After I ran around the Borough of Manhattan educating voters on all five questions, they passed, including ranked choice voting. The ones I'm most excited about are actually on the topic of ethics reform. Although I prefer Senator Warren's lifetime ban on lobbying for elected officials, voters chose to double the existing one-year ban to two years. We won protections for the borough president and public advocate from having their budgets cut by a vengeful council or mayor, and we also gave residents more, a more meaningful role in the land use process by adding community board engagement at the beginning of the process. When I was elected, Billionaire's Row was marching from the commercial business district in Midtown Manhattan 
into residential districts on the Upper East Side. Then we did something that hadn't been done before, winning the largest first of its kind grassroots rezoning which stopped the march of super talls in the Sutton area. Although the Board of Standards and Appeals overturned the community's victory and grandfathered one building, we successfully won protections for our neighborhood. I sued the city alongside the community over the grandfather clause, and despite a recent setback at the trial court, we intend to file a notice of appeal. When developers began creating loopholes like gerrymandered zoning lots and empty spaces in buildings, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer and Senator Liz Kruger joined Carnegie Hill neighbors, Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts, and me in the fight at 180 East 88th Street. When a developer proposed a 150-foot empty space at East 62nd Street and a 176-foot space at West 66, we built a borough-wide coalition, including Landmarks West, to close the loopholes. There is a problem when developers would rather build empty spaces and buildings to give billionaires a better view than build affordable housing. I visited nearly every community board in Manhattan to pass resolutions to protect us from mechanical voids of unlimited height in residential districts and led the city council in passing this change. No sooner did we close that loophole did developers take the walls off the void to make the buildings on stilts. Our coalition continues to move forward alongside Borough President Gail Brewer on two additional citywide zonings to ch changes to limit stilts and gerrymandered lots. I also authored legislation co-sponsored by the Borough President that already received a hearing that would give community boards and elected officials public notifications when developers merge zoning lots to build taller. When the city proposed building a luxury skyscraper on public housing playground, Congress member Carolyn Maloney, Borough President Gail Brewer, and I supported the community in their years-long fight. Following the Borough President's lawsuits, residents won with the city agreeing to withdraw and start over. We've used funds from our office to provide financial support to attorney at take, attorneys at Take Roots Justice for a new lawsuit to secure heat and hot water for our tenants in public housing, and they've been winning in court. <laughs> During my time as chair of the Land Use Subcommittee, we were able to ensure every tax, tax dollar allocated for housing was used to build the most affordable housing possible for the lowest income New Yorkers. In just over a year, we were able to preserve or create nearly 6,000 units of affordable housing throughout New York City. For people who think they can build their way out of the housing crisis with market rate condos, the New York Times and the Atlantic recently shared that of all the condos built since 1995, half of them are sitting there empty. For those who have an oversimplified understanding of economics or who believe we just need to have a supply exceed demand, it is time to face the reality that developers would rather leave their condos empty than make anything affordable for everyday New Yorkers. Now I support Mayor de Blasio's plan to build or preserve 300,000 units of affordable housing, but those units are only offered through a lottery involving tens if not hundreds of thousands of people applying for each one. Being able to afford to live in our great city shouldn't just be a matter of winning the lottery. Worse yet, I learned from a hero and whistleblower, Stephen Werner at HPD, that more than 200,000 units of affordable housing might be getting billions in city subsidies while charging market rates. Working with him, ProPublica, his union organization, the staff, the, his union, the organization of staff analysts, and again, another bill co-sponsored by Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, uh, we authored Local Law 64 to force landlords to register every city subsidized affordable unit and to let middle class and low income New Yorkers apply for hundreds of thousands of existing affordable housing units. That system should go online this June. A symptom of the affordable housing crisis is the homeless crisis as families are literally forced out onto our streets. We are finally stemming the tide on homelessness with less than 60,000 people in our shelters, 10% down from our high water mark. It's important to see the face of homelessness in our city. 
as of Friday, 21,399 children woke up in a shelter and went to public school. 16,035 parents, 12,455 single men, and 4,728 single women. In 2016, I launched the Eastside Task Force for Homeless Outreach and Services with Borough President Gail Brewer, State Senator Liz Kruger, and the Department of Social Services convening local churches, synagogues, and nonprofits with city agencies. Together, we are devoted to building supportive housing in the district and helping the homeless. By 2017, we broke ground on a supportive housing facility for women in need on East 91st Street. In August, we officially cut the ribbon to welcome 17 families to supportive housing, plus a Sunshine Early Learning Center for children living in the building and the surrounding communities. This supportive housing is across the street from where I live and the park where I play with my daughter, and I couldn't be happier. It is our hope that every unsheltered person living on the streets gets the help they need. If you see one of our city's most vulnerable on the street, please do not give them money and pay them to stay on the street. Instead, please call 311 or use the NYC 311 app to ask them to dispatch homeless outreach team. And if you can, please consider financially supporting or volunteering with our ethos partners in their district service to help those who are less fortunate. Living in tiny apartments in the densest neighborhood in America, we need our parks. When I got elected, the waterfront parks were at risk of falling into the river, and then they did. I worked together with Congress member Carolyn Maloney as co-chairs of the East River Esplanade Task Force. This year alone, we broke ground on a $3.3 million renovation of Carl Schurz Park Playground funded by Council District 5 and Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. Opened a quarter of an acre in Sutton Parks, connecting two parks with the help of the Conservancy. Worked with constituent and parent Greg Davis, whose two sons play basketball at John Jay Park, to get the Parks Department to replace the backboards and paint new courts with $7,500 in funding from my office. Cut the ribbon and made a splash on a $1 million investment for the pool at John Jay Park. We will also break ground this spring on a long sought after adult space. We <laughs> uh, thank you, Betty. <laughs> uh, we cut the ribbon on $15 million in renovations by Rockefeller University on a section of the East River Esplanade from 62nd to 68th. Secured an additional $75 million in mayoral funding for the ongoing reconstruction of the East River Esplanade. Last but not least, we broke ground on the $100 million East Midtown Greenway, which will run between East 53rd and 61st Street. Our grand total so far is a whopping $275 million dollars. And in the time that remains, I want to double that investment. <laughs> We're also improving access to existing parks. Working with Congress member Carol Maloney, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, and Assemblymember Dan Court, we were able to negotiate with Parks Department and Dr. Tony Skolnick, who is here today, and thank you, to open access to indoor tennis at Queensboro Oval year-round to the community. Now the community can play tennis for free with a te Parks Tennis Permit starting in April through Labor Day at a total cost for the season of $10 for youth, $20 for seniors, and $100 for everyone else. Throughout the winter months, take advantage of $10 drop-ins for early mornings, afternoons, and late evenings, as well as $10 clinics for residents and seniors. We even offer 300 scholarships for children and free access for Yorkville Athletics and Hunter College. Thank you very much to Tony. <laughs> Having parks and access to open space is incredibly important to our health and the health of our communities. More than half of New York City's adults are overweight or obese, and one in five kindergarten students enter schools already obese. The truth is that an eight-year-old would need to walk the distance between City Hall and Times Square to just walk off the calories from a 12-ounce soda, and kids their age aren't getting that much exercise in schools. The Healthy Happy Meals law I authored with the American Heart Association is backed by peer-reviewed research and gained the crucial support of Speaker Corey Johnson to pass last year. 
McDonald's even testified that they implemented the law on their kids' menu back in 2013, leading to healthy drinks being served with more than half of their Happy Meals. Starting in April, my law requires every restaurant in New York City to only offer water, low-fat milk, or 100% fruit juice as part of any children's meal. Following a Legionnaire's outbreak, I co-sponsored a law mandating inspection of cooling towers. When a Legionnaire's cluster appeared on the east side in 2017, I changed city policy so that we can clean all towers that test positive for Legionella bacteria to avoid their advancement to Legionnaires. In 2018, WNYC found that more than 20% of the towers were out of compliance with the law I co-sponsored. So in 2019, I authored and passed legislation to remind cooling tower owners to inspect and to require them to report to the city when inspections are complete so you can make sure they're getting done, keeping vulnerable residents safe. Perhaps the biggest threat to our city and the planet is climate change. That's why last year I introduced a resolution declaring a climate emergency with Environmental Protection Committee Chair Costa Constantinides, authored by Extinction Rebellion. Within days of the hearing, we became the biggest city on the planet to pass this declaration, making international news. A week later, Senator Sanders introduced the resolution in Congress. If it wasn't clear by now, when I say you can work with our office to author laws, I mean it. I'm also lucky to have an amazing group of constituents who I learn from every day. I even introduced one bill because of what I learned in kindergarten. Not mine, but at PS290, where the five-year-olds taught me a chant. Ban toxic pesticides, use only nature's pesticides. <laughs> We've been working on this legislation since 2015 to ban the spraying of carcinogens like glyphosate, the key ingredient in Roundup, in our city's parks, where children play and if they are anything like my daughter, put their hands in their mouths. I hope you will join us Wednesday, January 29th at 10 a.m. at City Hall to testify in favor of this important legislation. As we protect our children for carcinogens in the ground, we must protect everyone from the harm from above. As of today, there are 9,384 scaffold structures covering 344 miles of sidewalk in New York City to protect us from falling bricks that recently claimed one life as the city literally crumbles around us. I've authored legislation to force landlords to make repairs when sidewalk sheds go up or have the city step in and do it. Following the collapse of sidewalk sheds throughout our city, I've also proposed requiring the city to inspect sheds as they go up and every six months thereafter. The city has recently announced that it will be inspecting every sidewalk shed and step in to do the work on the most dangerous buildings and make bad landlords pay. Now, if you own a car, you have to maintain it. The same thing should go for owning a building. While sidewalk sheds might be a pet peeve, the top complaint in New York City is noise, particularly from after hours construction. That's why in 2017, I authored the law with the support of environmental chair Constantinides to reduce noise on after hours constructions from 85 decibels to 75 decibels, a reduction of about half. The change went into effect this new year, so hopefully you will hear or not hear the difference. We also changed the law so violations could be issued without having to measure the noise from inside someone's home. Mike Edison, a constituent who has worked with my office, took the fight to get a quieter city into his own hands by winning a lawsuit against construction companies and small claims court, forcing loud construction sites to pay up and turn down the noise. When I got elected, it was a lot harder to get around, and good luck even getting on the 456 or F during rush hour. Since then, we've opened the Second Avenue subway, two new ferry stops serving the district, brought select bus service to two crosstown routes, and even launched bike share. With bike ridership more than doubling, we've worked with the Department of Transportation, the NYPD's 17th and 19th Precinct, Councilmember Keith Powers on a bike safety program that's been making our streets safer. We need to keep pedestrians, cyclists, and motorists safe from one another by giving each their own space on the road. For pedestrians, we've added leading pedestrian intervals along York Avenue and safety neck downs. For bikes, we've more than doubled bike lanes complete with more crosstown lanes. Lastly, we made it safer to cross the mouth of the Queensboro Bridge. We've offered bike safety classes in schools, bike shops, and our office where attendees get a free month on city bike membership. 
We've held trainings in English, Spanish, and Chinese, and given attendees free safety equipment. Bike enforcement by our police precinct is higher than anywhere else in the city, up from 100 when I got elected to 2,472 summonses issued to bicycles. As we near the end of this year's State of the District, it is funny to think that what I am best known for is putting a new covered trash can on every corner. We've, <laughs> we've purchased 560 of them, but who's counting? With every corner covered, we are now working with Wildcat to help people get back on their feet while cleaning up the neighborhood four days a week. Sweeping sidewalks and bike islands, cleaning the gutters and drain for, of blockages, and removing bags caught in branches and litter from tree pits. We've even been power washing our sidewalks alongside our Congress member, Carolyn Maloney. As we conclude, please join us for our volunteer fair and of course enjoy coffee with Kalos and bagels with Ben. Please complete the evaluation form in your reusable bag to let us know how we can do better. Uh, and please stay seated though, because there's more. Uh, and consider joining me for the selfie line. The state of our district is strong, not because of what I've done, but because of what we've been able to accomplish together. We've already done so much, and yet we have so much more left to do. I'd like to note we've been joined by our Congress member, Carol Maloney, who will address you in just a couple of moments. Uh, and so I've been your council member now for six years, 25 days, uh, 14 hours, 12 minutes, and 18 seconds. What can we accomplish together in the remaining one year, 11 months, five days, nine hours, 48 minutes, and 36 seconds? Thank you. Now, I just spent about half an hour uh, talking about all the great work we've been able to do with our Congress member, Carol Maloney. Uh, so I bear, she, she needs no additional introduction beyond the fact that she is now the first woman to chair the Oversight Committee. And it was with <laughs> And what makes me proudest is that she impeached Trump. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you for supporting uh, government. Thank you for supporting our, our, our city council member. And uh, this is all a team effort. And I see uh, our, our Burr president, Gail Brewer, who uh, is always there on all of our concerns. And, and the head of uh, Holmes Towers, uh, Ms. Coleman, who has done an incredible job. In government, it's not so much what you do sometimes. It's what you hold on to when people are coming after it. And the developers and some elected officials, including our mayor, were supporting selling the playground at homes uh, for uh, high-rise, uh, uh, you know, uh, luxury housing. And it was because of a tenant leader like Ms. Coleman and, and, and Gail Brewer and others that we went to court, we won, we fought, and we kept the playground for the children on public housing. So I want to congratulate you and other leaders that were there and those of you who supported that effort. Uh, I, I am here today really in support of Ben and his work. I find him absolutely extraordinary. Uh, as a former teacher, one of my top priorities was always education and fighting for schools here on the east side. What a fight we had. Uh, when I was on the city council, I formed a task force for more seats on the east side, went to Congress, and even though it's a city issue, continued to chair this uh, seat. We proceeded to build roughly six or seven new schools. Uh, but in the fight over the kindergarten seats, oh my goodness, I would get these calls uh, in Washington where children could not find a seat. And he took that like a goal. Uh, uh, that he would not give up on and has fought to get more, 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 more seats on the Upper East Side. I don't know why it is. People, it's always been hard to get the services. And I've had a very, have to have a very sharp uh, pencil and a, a, a sharp fist to hold on to what's fair for the East Side. I remember when we first started arguing about uh, 
uh, you know, the east side and we needed more schools. Uh, people at City Hall would say things, well, you don't really because they can just move out. I said, yeah, you want to move out? Uh, they're paying taxes, they're here, they're entitled to have their schools in their neighborhoods for their children. But one of my goals was always the Esplanade. I went to San Francisco, they had a beautiful waterfront. Our waterfront was an absolute disgrace. You couldn't even use it. You didn't have access to it. So uh, with Jessica Lappin, we formed a task force to beautify the, the waterfront and started meeting monthly with the Parks Department, repairing it and uh, going after making it uh, better. Well now, when he got elected, I said, Ben, let's continue this work. He has been spectacular. We have almost $300 million that I've worked with him and supported his efforts, but he's basically been the one to do it, to put the pieces together to make that happen. And nothing makes me happier than in the summer to go along our parks on the water. We're not stopping till we have a green necklace all the way around Manhattan, and Gail Brewer has been a great person uh, doing that. So I'm, I'm here supporting him. Actually, he's running for Burr president. I don't think we could get anyone more committed to uh, getting the job done uh, for our city and for our borough. Uh, if you ever want to hear a story about how we have to fight, look at the Second Avenue subway. Those of you who are old enough remember that they tore down the L train promising us a subway. We never got it. Every time we got money, they'd take it and spend it somewhere else. So when I got elected to Congress, I said, I'm going to build that Second Avenue subway. And the mayor and the governor at that time were opposed to it. I couldn't even get a letter of support from them. But I, I, my office uh, and other electeds like Gail and, and, and Ben and others of, of that you are here were supportive. We, we are the only subway that's been built, not in New York City, not in New York State, but in the entire country during the time that I've been in Congress. And it is a model, it is beautiful, and from the state we just got four billion to go all the way up to 125th Street. But, and, and it got to a disaster. Remember, the Lex Line's a great line, but it's the most overcrowded in the whole country, seriously. And on day one, the Second Avenue subway moved 300,000 people. And, the, and uh, it got to a point there was almost a riot of people trying to get on the subway in, in uh, rush hour. So we were entitled to that money. Uh, we were uh, underserved, and we needed to get that uh, allocated for our district. I'm pleased to have been able to do that for you. All I can say is that I'm busy now. I'm uh, one of the managers in what this uh, impeachment process. There were four committees that were involved in and putting the paperwork together and uh, coming up with the strategy and the articles of impeachment. And he was impeached in the United States House of Representatives. He is impeached. <laughs> and the information is undeniable. It is irrefutable. It is overwhelming. And the report that we put forward, I was one of five people, along with the speaker, who signed the articles of impeachment that went to the, uh, to the Senate. And uh, I'm glad I wasn't one of the managers, because I've got to get home to my district. I have a serious challenge from four different people coming after me. And because of my job, I'm even more down in Washington at least five days a week, sometimes weekends. During the impeachment, I didn't go home for about three weeks. We were just up there full time working on it. Uh, but there are two articles of impeachment. One is that he abused the power of his office uh, for his own personal and political gain to the detriment of our national security. Now, when you look at it, this was a joint bipartisan decision uh, where we allocated roughly 400 million to defend Ukraine from an invading enemy, uh, Russia, that took over Crimea had plans to take half of the country and then the full country, according to the State Department uh, testimony that we received. And uh, we needed to release that money. He tried to stop it for his own political, personal gain. It's outrageous, beyond belief, and indisputable. He should be removed from office in the Senate. But. Uh, <laughs> 
the Senate is the Senate, and we have 275 bills that are good bills. I could go through all of them, great bills, sitting on Mitch McConnell's desk so he will not act. Now, this week, we're going to hear from the uh, president's uh, defense team, and then there will be 16 hours of questions, at which point the First Amendment, our proposal the Democrats will push, is that additional witnesses and information can come into the hearing. So that will be a huge test. And uh, we have all these people who are saying they want to testify. Uh, Mitch Mulvaney, he was in all those meetings. He should be in there. So that's going to be a, a test of the Republicans. There is no reason why they should not allow uh, information and witnesses in a trial. That's what a trial's about. But uh, it won't, it's not even a fair trial unless they a, a allow it. So that's what we'll be looking at, and then they will be voting on whether or not he will be convicted. So that is the story of the day. Uh, but behind that, there is an incredible attack on health care, on health care that could take away the Affordable Care Act, on which 30 million Americans are depending on it. It is in a court case. They've won in, in uh, Texas. They're going to the, they are in the Supreme Court. The Democrats put in a case to expedite it, to have the hearing right now to try to save it. They put it off. We lost that case. A decision will not come out until after the election. But they, if they roll back the Affordable Care Act, what is really problematic is that uh, pre-existing conditions will no longer be covered. They used to not cover it. Well, everything's a pre-existing condition. It used to be that they considered pregnancy a pre-existing condition. I'm not kidding. I would have pregnant women come to me. They couldn't get insurance because pregnancy was a talk about being family friendly. This country was not family friendly when you're not supporting health insurance and during the birth of a child. So if they succeed in rolling this back, they will erase health care. I'm told it's at least 8 million uh, New Yorkers are in this program, and uh, that is a, a big, big problem. So we are fighting to hold on to uh, health care, and I'm, I'm a, uh, uh, I didn't start out here, but I, now I am a firm believer in Medicare for all. Um, one of the problems is people get in there as middlemen, and start running the price up and uh, causing all kinds of problems. Why do we have the most expensive drugs in the world when we pay for the research and then it's developed in our country and then they sell it to every other country in the world for less than what we are charged? We are subsidizing their efforts selling drugs everywhere. Everybody's going to foreign countries to get their drugs. This is outrageous. We have one simple bill. On, the, on Mitch McConnell's desk that would allow us to competitively uh, negotiate for lower drug prices. Let's get that passed. On my committee, I'm going to start a series of hearings of the abuses in the, in the pharmaceutical industry of running up prices to prices people cannot afford. And we have to get that bill passed. All I can say is that we are here to uh, really congratulate Ben on his service and his achievements. Uh, he's been an extraordinary leader. I thank all of you for being here and for supporting him. And I, uh, we should have a town hall where we can get into all these issues. I got a lot more I got to get off my chest. But we, we have refreshments out there for you. It's a great honor to represent you. And God bless you. God bless this neighborhood in uh, America. It's, a, it's only getting better, believe me. <laughs> So can we hear it one more time for America's Congress member, our Congress member, Carol Maloney. And, and so this is, this is a government event, so we can't do too much politics. What we can do is remind you of some very, very important dates. Uh, so if you are uh, a, a registered voter and uh, if you are registered with the Democratic Party, there will be a primary uh, for who your selection is to be the Democratic nominee on April 28th, 2020. So if you're not registered yet, please do so. Uh, as, as mentioned, uh, not 
I, I believe almost every congressional district uh, will likely have a, a primary. Uh, and at least for the Democratic primary in this district, it will be June 23rd, uh, 2020. And I encourage you all to please uh, turn out and vote. And uh, last but not, and, and I think I'll, I'll just say, I think you, you've, you've heard our speech. So uh, uh, June 23rd is that election. And then November 3rd, 2020 uh, is perhaps the, the most important day this coming year and that is a make or break day for the future of our nation. So I think those are three important dates coming up. Uh, and so I wanna thank our Congress member. If we can give her one more round of applause, please. <laughs> and as, as mentioned, our Congress member uh, leads the oversight committee where she uh, took part in one of the three committees that were necessary to impeach uh, President Donald Trump and so now we need a little bit of help from our senior senator in the state of New York uh, and the minority leader in the Senate, uh, and that is our, states, our, our United States Senator Chuck Schumer. And so uh, we, we have a, a surprise, which is that uh, he, he uh, when I was in law school, I actually interned for him. <laughs> And uh, so we asked if he wanted to stop by, and so he's been struggling to get here all morning. And uh, he should be here in about 10, 15 minutes, so I can just see a show of hands. Uh, who, who would like to hang here and wait for him in here, and who here would just like to get the coffee and bagels, and he can address you while you have the bagels? So uh, who wants to stay? Okay, and who, who wants to get some food? Okay, so the food will wait. The bagels will not get cold. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, so uh, if you can hang tight for about uh, about 10, 15 minutes, we'll have. Uh, we are taking questions. <laughs> Gail Brewer will help me take those questions. Uh, sure, uh, in the uh, in the t in the white, yes. If you can share your name and your question. Yes. Thank you. Good question. Uh, so, as of 2002, uh, people who had green cards, and in fact, uh, anyone in our city was able to vote in school board elections uh, during that administration, they lost that right. And in fact, if you look back at our nation's history, uh, people were literally getting off boats uh, in Manhattan and voting in elections. Uh, and uh, you, you can watch Gangs of New York or any of those movies where they actually dip into that history. So it's actually something that was present. There are many cities all over our country that actually allow it. And so this would only be for municipal office. Uh, actually, in some states, you could have vote. You, uh, people with green cards can vote for Congress, not in this state. Uh, so, what we are looking to say is, you, you still can't vote for Congress, you can't vote for president, but at least when it comes to your city elected officials, your mayor on down to your council, um, I think it's incredibly important. One of the reasons is, uh, this our city is about 40% foreign born. My grandparents were foreign born. My wife wasn't born in this country. She immigrated here to flee anti-Semitism. And what I've seen throughout our city is in this district, we actually have almost, we have more registered voters than almost anywhere other than Gale Brewer's old council district on the west side. They have like twice everybody else. But there are parts of the city which have uh, a high immigrant population, a high low income community of color, where you see elected officials who can disregard entire swaths of the city uh, and do whatever real estate developers want while they force those folks out. So. Uh, for those reasons, I'm in favor of allowing green card holders to vote. I will. I, I thank our borough president for opening up Q and A, and she will help me out on this specific question. <laughs> I, I want to say this is a very controversial topic. We had a press conference and we understand that. I would say that you have to have a green card. Green card takes time to get. You do not just walk in from another country. 
I would bet that you know many people who have green cards and you don't know that they have a green card. There are the people who are working, there are people who are in your schools, there are people who are your neighbors. You have no idea because they are just like anybody else. And I think, for well, whatever reason, we vote in this room, but awful lot of New Yorkers just don't vote. They gotta vote. And this would help, I think, get some of the issues that we want to be part of our agenda. So they're just regular folks like everybody else. Like I said, you have to have green card, which is a card that helps you to become a citizen. I have an example. I have a friend who's a doctor. She just got her green card. That's an example of somebody who is able to vote. So let's, 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 let's see what happens. But I can say that instead of saying this is not a good idea, realize that it's your neighbor. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. And the purple, yes. Great. So, so universal pre-K is done. We actually have for 3K. So Mayor de Blasio announced uh, in 2000 and about 18, I believe, that he would be doing universal 3K. And as soon as that happened, I raised my hand and said, the Upper East Side was the last to get pre-K, so we should be the first to get 3K. They've now rolled it out to about 16 districts. The Upper East Side is not included. Uh, I will be very honest, the Upper East Side is in a bizarre school district that starts at 100th Street in my district and works its way down to Midtown, then goes westward to the Hudson River. It literally touches the East River and the Hudson River, and then it goes all the way down to the tip of Manhattan. It is the largest school district with about 60,000 students. Uh, our estimate is that um, in order, there are currently 4,000 pre-K seats. We would need another 4,000 3K seats. And so where we're at is we're this is not, our district is not currently included in the rollout. Uh, the mayor had said he wanted the rollout by 2021. Not likely either. Uh, it is possible it could be by 2022. I'll be honest, it would be too late for my daughter and, and your two children uh, who are two years old. Uh, so I'm trying to get it done before the next person comes in to succeed me. Uh, and so we did a cost estimate and it currently cost, we currently have 4,000 3K seats citywide, as it were, and that costs about $66 million. So at the last budget briefing with the mayor, I asked the mayor for another $66 million to cover uh, District 2 and double the seats. And that being said, we've actually been working very closely with our Congress member, Carol Maloney, our borough president, Gail Brewer, and all the local elected officials. We actually have cited uh, the 1,000 seats we need for our neighborhood. We found schools, any locations. Uh, if you know of a community-based organization, whether for-profit, non-profit, or faith-based, that's interested in being a 3K site, we're interested in working with you on that. So thank you. Uh, Be uh, Betty, then Peter. <coughs> Hold on. Let, uh, Betty, Betty, then Peter. I'll, I'll repeat her question. But I'd like to hear it. And also, what can we do to move that along? Because sure. the longer we wait, the harder it's going to be. Sure. I, I will take the question if anyone, if the borough president wants to jump in. So when I first got elected, uh, I saw a lot of towers coming in. I saw a lot of the townhouses along the avenues coming down. And with the Second Avenue subway, we've seen a lot of blocks getting warehoused. We've now seen 79th Street come down. We've now seen 86th Street come down. And I'm concerned about buildings that are very, very tall being built for billionaires and millionaires and not getting any housing for people who are our income. So no matter what, the density on our avenues is about 10 or 12, which is the highest allowed under law. And so what we did is we went to city planning uh, the City Planning Commission has five appointments from the borough presidents, uh, but it has seven appointments from the mayor, or is it six? Seven. 
It is seven appointments by the mayor. So the mayor has uh, complete control over that uh, city planning commission. So he went to the city planning commission and said, we'd like to do a 210 foot cap for affordability and say that if you want to build affordable housing uh, and you can build taller. So when we negotiated something called mandatory inclusionary housing, uh, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer and I actually fought the mayor because they said we want to let buildings be on New York Avenue, First Avenue, and 79th. There's places that are capped at 210. And the mayor said we want it to be 260, period. They don't have to build affordable housing. And the borough president and I and Jamani Williams and one other were able to force them below 96th Street in Manhattan. If they want additional height, they must build affordable housing. And so I think it would be very useful. So we, gave, we went to city planning. They said no. Uh, we used your tax dollars. We gave funding to Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts and Civitas to do a study saying, can we do this? And uh, Friends came back and went to city planning and said, we think we can do this. But city planning said no. And so we, Friends said, OK, let's figure out if we can hire somebody to bring a 210-foot height limit and hire attorneys and environmental engineers. And we actually couldn't find anyone in the city we could pay to do it. Uh, what they did find is somebody who said, uh, a gentleman by the names of George Janes, that we could uh, close the loopholes, where we've actually been very successful and the city planning has been very uh, responsive. At the same time, Civitas has come back and said they wanted to do a 400-foot height cap, which I found to be uh, something that was a little bit too tall for this neighborhood. And so now they've come back at 300 feet and then if you build affordable housing, 50 feet. Uh, for, for my sake, my goal is always to get progress. So no height limit is bad. We just got a new skyscraper at 180 East 88th. They're trying to build 800 feet at Sutton. So anything better than that is better. So whether it's 400, 300, or 210, I support any and all of it, and I'm trying to get it done. Uh, I think for my hope, we talked a lot about the real estate money and politics. I think that if we can elect a mayor without real estate money and borough presidents without real estate money and a council without real estate money, I think we have a shot at getting it done in 2022. But that being said, I'm going to keep trying to get it done for 2021. Uh, OK, uh, Peter. Sure. Uh, the mayor, to his credit, has done universal middle school. And so that's being provided to 77,000 middle school students. Uh, however, as all of us know, parents get home after kids get out of school, and there's that gap. And so we're looking to do it for elementary. Uh, we had the hearing. Uh, there was a lot of support, including from our borough president, from the Youth Services Committee chair. We think we can get it done for about $100 million. And before anyone gets worried about taxes going up, the thing I'd put out there is that I think we spend nearly a billion dollars on the juvenile justice system. Uh, do we have, it? sir? Uh, you you were you were in the presentation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> then you. Sure, absolutely. Do you want to? So uh, for those of you who aren't in the loop on this, uh, the city council is very parochial. And uh, council members are able to have pretty much a veto on any project in their district. So I, I will tell you right now, if anyone ever came to me and said, I will put up a 700-foot tower and I'll give you a couple of schools, I would say, are you out of your mind? Uh, that being said, uh, the local council member, as well as uh, uh, voted to change it to 700 feet. In addition, your state electeds also voted to alienate a park in order to take away parkland in the city of New York. The state also needs to act. And so what has been put forth is a 700 foot tower with uh, 1,000 uh, apartments and uh, four schools. I will say that our borough president, Gail Brewer, was actually able to knock height off of that tower. 
there was litigation uh, led by Carnegie Hill neighbors and co former Commissioner Benepe, and I will turn it over to the borough president because this is this is slightly out of my district. Well, I, I mean, I, uh, of course, council member said everything correctly. At this point, it's you know somewhat stalled. It hasn't. It's not moving. I don't know if it's financial. Um, I will say that the schools need help. So if we are not building this particular building, it is big, it is tall, it does not have enough affordable housing, um, and the alienation is still an issue. But we still have four schools that are in really bad shape, um, and we need to figure out what to do. So it's like everything else that we're trying to grapple with. You've got a tall building that's too tall, not enough affordable housing, schools that need help, a park that should have been alienated. When we signed off on it, we thought the park had been alienated. Nobody had told us it had not. So I think it's uh, to be seen what's going to happen. Uh, in front, and then uh, Andrew Fine and back. Yeah. Gail, come on back up. Okay, uh, we're going to be really quick, and then we'll bring up our special guest. Uh, so um, the Upper East Side used to have a mom-and-pop zoning on 86th Street to preserve the small businesses. And actually, we will, we will skip and just uh, we'll answer you in a moment. If you can join us in welcoming our uh, Senate Minority Leader, Chuck Schumer. Thank you for making it. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Excuse me. I was in, I was a little late because it is the Chinese New Year and we had a great parade in Brooklyn. <laughs> Brooklyn has now grown and has its own parade in addition to the Manhattan Parade, which I march in. So first, let me thank Ben for inviting me and for the great job he has done as your council member. He is dedicated, he's hardworking. He's always out there figuring out issues to push forward on, and uh, we very much appreciate, Ben, your service. Uh, as, as Washington has taught us with the presidency and the Republican Senate, we need good elected officials more than ever before. So thank you for putting yourself forward and running. I'm going to be brief here because I know I'm late. I'll give you a little rundown with impeachment and uh, a few other things, and then uh, I know you want to have bagels with Ben. Um, I have learned that I am gluten-free in the, by the way, they have figured out now that about 5% of people over 55 develop, and it's not celiac. In other words, if I eat gluten, I don't get sick, but you become gluten-resistant. Your autoimmune system spends time fighting the gluten, and you're more susceptible to colds and pneumonia. It's new. But next time you go to the doctor, get yourself checked. Anyway, I am gluten resistant, so I can't have bagels with Ben. Um, or pizza or other things, but whatever. The impeachment. L look, the bottom line is very, very simple. Uh, and that is that the Republicans are trying to make a mockery of an impeachment trial. And if that happens, you know, the Founding Fathers only really put two checks on a president who abuses power, who overreaches. One is elections, and ho hopefully the public will deal with that in the right way. I am optimistic that we will win in the elections. But the other is impeachment. And impeachment was designed not for somebody who simply broke the law, although that might be enough, although you know the Justice Department says a president can, this is pre-Trump, I think since the 80s, the Justice Department has said no president can be prosecuted while in office for a crime. So you can't successfully oust a president who break, breaks the law on a criminal case. But the other is impe but impeachment is for what they've called high crimes and misdemeanors. And I don't know if you saw Jerry Nadler, our Congress member from the uh, west side of Manhattan, did a great job outlining how that evolved. And it's clear, it's not, doesn't mean you broke the law, it means that you abuse the office of the presidency so 
that you deserve to be out of office. The case the House managers put together was very, very powerful. And the good news about this is that for a lot of our Republican colleagues, they never saw the whole case start to finish, particularly in that degree of granularity. And while you could see they didn't like hearing it, you know, a lot of the times they were looking the other way or yakking with their friends or just looking down. You're not allowed to have cell phones and uh, uh, iPads and stuff during the trial. When uh, a couple of times, and the three I remember, the two concluding remarks on Thursday and Friday night of, of Adam Schiff, and uh, Congress, uh, Congress member Garcia gave an amazing recantation of Alexander Vindman, the lieutenant colonel, where he would decided he'd come forward despite huge pressure from inside the train. Remember, he's an employee of the NSC still, National Security Council. And there was huge pressure from the Trump administration not to go forward, but he said he would, and his father called him. His father, they had emigrated from Ukraine, you know, decades ago. And of course, he served in the military in Iraq and has a Purple Heart. And the father said, uh, I don't know if you should do this. This may hurt your career. Um, and his son said, Dad, why did we leave Ukraine to come here? Because America is a country of truth. And I believe in it. And I believe if you do the right thing, you'll be protected. Well, that was an amazing rendition. And all the Republicans had their eyes fixed on her and what she said. And then they had a little tape of Vindman telling the Congress during the, uh, Cong during the House impeachment proceedings. And the same happened in both of Adam Schiff's amazing summaries. Our strategy, the strategy that I came up with and Nancy Pelosi was fully partner and on board with, has been to try and get the truth. Try and get the truth. And the only way you can get the truth, even though the case the House made was extremely powerful, I'm not allowed to say you know, I'm saying I think it's very powerful, extremely strong, very troubling. But as a juror, I say I'm going to wait to hear the other side before finally making up my mind. Anyway, um, although you know what direction I'm leaning in. <laughs> um, um, we, uh, there are Republicans who, as I say, hadn't heard all of this. And some of them say, well, we don't have enough evidence. So the strategy we devised was to focus on getting a fair trial, which is a hallmark of America. And that meant witnesses and documents. We didn't try to go on a fishing expedition. We asked for the four witnesses who were most likely to be eyewitness to why President Trump withheld the aid and how he did it, and why he obstructed the Congress and why he did that. And then we asked for four sets of documents that were contemporaneous with those activities. And we kept hammering away at fair trial. And as a result, the American people are overwhelmingly with us. Uh, you know, when they poll the Republicans, the Republican rank and file, they march lock, step, and barrel with Trump. This is one of the most dissolute. You know, Trump is one of the worst. He is. In, ca in terms of character and, and performance, I think he's the worst president we've ever had. But what bothers me even more that such a horrible man who has no fidelity to the truth, let's call it like it is, I'm from Brooklyn, he is a liar, um, has so many followers. And that's for a different discussion. But in any case, this time, 64% of Republicans bucked his view and said, there ought to be witnesses and documents, because it is a hallmark of America to believe in a fair trial. So that has been our pursuit. Now, to be honest with you, and the four witnesses we asked for were Mulvaney, who was the chief cook and bottle washer of the whole thing. And if you heard the recitation by Sundlin of, Volk, of, 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 of Bolton's testimony when he called it a drug deal, he said, he said basically, that it was Mulvaney who helped Trump cook this whole thing up. We asked for Bolton for obvious reasons. And then we asked for Blair, who was chief of staff to Mulvaney, and this fellow Duffy, who was the guy at OMB who was responsible for cutting off the aid, 
and in subsequent emails after the impeachment, the House voted on the impeachment articles, they got two emails through FOIA requests um, that, sh that Duffy said hide th was cutting off the aid 90 minutes after Trump's famous perfect phone call on July 15th with uh, um, uh, uh, Zelensky. And he also, a few days later, said, I got direct orders from the president. So obviously, he'd be an important witness, and all the documents that way. We don't honestly know what they'll say. We're seeking a fair trial. That's the truth, the God's honest truth. We think it's likely that they'll, they'll, they'll be further uh, condemning President Trump, further incriminating, but there's a chance they may be exculpatory, and these are not. These are Trump's men. These are not Democratic plants or never Trumpers. They're the people he appointed. We need, as you know, four Republicans. And it's an uphill fight to even get four on such an obvious situation because of the huge pressure from Trump. All the Republican senators remember what he did to Flake and um, Corker who were the two senators who had the temerity to oppose him last time, and so they're afraid. Will four rise to the occasion? Here's what I can say. I can say I know there's tremendous pressure on them, and I think it is an uphill fight. I wouldn't want to delude you, even though it would seem so obvious and logical they should vote yes. But um, the one thing we have on our side, even though it's an uphill fight, is that their public is overwhelmingly against them. And these senators, particularly those, you know, from states that are bluish and are in contest in 2016, they go home and they get asked questions like, are you for a fair trial? And they duck the answer. And there are still nine or 10 Republican senators when asked, do you think there should be witnesses and documents have avoided answering it. So I'd put it this way, are we likely to win on this witness and documents? No. But is it certain we won't win? No. We got a shot. And you never know, I sat through the previous impeachment proceedings. I was a, I'm a historical footnote, because you may remember in 1998, when the House voted to, to send articles to Clinton, I was a congressman. But I had just beaten Al D'Amato, with many of your help, and so in 1999, I was a juror. So I'm a historical footnote, because I voted three times on one impeachment, first House Judiciary Committee, then House Floor, then Senate. Um, it, it does fall on people's shoulders in different ways. And when you're forced to sit there and forced to listen, and you see the Chief Justice, the weight of history in the Constitution weighs on some people's shoulders. So there's a chance. I will say this. If, God forbid, they don't vote for witnesses and uh, documents, we still will accomplish something. Because any acquittal of President Trump will be seen as a sham, as a farce. Because they didn't want to get all the information, they rushed through the trial, and it will lose all value. And so that's the, even if we lose, I wouldn't say we win, but even if we lose, there's clearly some real benefit to this strong pursuit we've made of witnesses and documents. Having said that, I do believe that this man is a menace to America. I do believe if he wins re-election or stays in office in one way or another, that our democracy, and I'm not being rhetorical, is truly at risk, truly at risk. The three powers that the Founding Fathers set up against an overarch or over a tyrant, they would call it, because they were worried about King George, are as follows. The Congress, and he has shown an ability to just go right around the Congress with Mitch McConnell's total, total uh, going along with acquiescence or support. So he comes up, you know, we didn't vote money for the wall, but he took money out of the military and said it's an emergency. And he can do that on anything if he wants. The second is the courts, and you've seen what they've done with the courts. They've made them into total, whoops. And the third is the free press, and they are doing everything what dictators do. No iPhone, folks. 
Putin is not listening to me, in on me. I'll call back. Um, uh, all my colleagues can reach me. It's one of the reasons we have such unity. But in any case, uh, the press. And this is, he takes a page in two ways out of dictators, dictators. Dictators always want to discredit the free press. And they wanted their public to believe anything that's said against them in a free press is fake, is false news. He's trying to do that. And if we all believe all news is fake, that's it. Our republic is pretty much gone. And second, they try to take over the press. Orban, Orban's friends in Hungary are buying all the newspapers up. Well, we have Fox News, which is a subsidiary of Trump. One of the reasons the Repo I think sitting in the, in the trial matters is because most of the Republicans have only gotten their news or much of their news from Fox. And if you watch Fox, which I have to do as part of my job to understand what the opposite side is doing, they totally distort anything that's a positive, you know, anything good that happened in the trial from our point of view is not in there or distorted. So no one gets the truth. So there's a real worry here. And the one thing I would urge you to do is do everything you can, one way, one way, this way, or the other, the election, to make sure this man is not president again. The little bit of good news which I'd share with you is my quest to become majority leader, and I'll conclude on this, I know you've waited a while, my quest to become majority leader is looking better and better. And many of these same Republican senators who were refusing to even condemn Trump for what he did, you know, the reporters asked, well, what is what he did wrong, even if you don't think it's impeachable? They're afraid to even say that. And because of this and everything else, are hurting. And so we have a good chance. We have eight or nine states. The map is totally the opposite of last time where we really have only one Democratic senator who's vulnerable, and they have eight or nine who are. And I'll tell you, I'll just quickly, if I win the majority leadership, we are not going to make the mistake that was made in 2009 and 10 and just try to do one thing for a year and a half. We did a very good thing, health care, but it wasn't enough when we had, last time we had the House, the Senate, and the presidency. And the three things broadly defined that I want to get done are climate change, income inequality, the flow of wealth and income to the very top, which has a lot of subsidiary things to do, obvious ones like education and college and infrastructure and health care, and some other ones that are not obviously related but re are related. Immigration reform would unleash huge economic benefit, and so would criminal justice reform. So, you know, millions of young men and women lives aren't totally uh, negated economic lives because they had a small amount of marijuana in their pocket when they were younger. And the third is democracy, H.R. 1, which has a lot of phases, getting rid of Citizens United, restoring teeth to the, <laughs> restoring teeth the Voting Rights Act, and something that I hope New York State will do, Ben, New York City I don't think can do it on its own. Um, is automatic voter registration. You show up on election day, you vote. There'd be, there'd be 10 million more votes, and we probably wouldn't have to work so hard to keep our country on track. So thank you for being here. Thank you for caring. Thank you for being a friend of Ben's, and enjoy your bagels. Thank you. Let's hear it one more time for soon-to-be Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. Uh, thank you all for staying, and uh, I think we now know more than anyone else in the country. Uh, thank you to our borough president for staying the whole time, our Congress member Carol Maloney. Thank you for spending an amazing Sunday with us. Uh, and join us for coffee with Kalos Bagels with Ben, and meet me in the selfie line.